It was in the 1700s when the 13 colonies had just been established under the original purpose of free freedom to worship that the people began to slide. Corruption seeped in, leached in, and people began forgetting who they were, that the very schools that we started was really to teach children how to read and write so that they can read the scriptures. Did you know that Harvard was started by a pastor, Pastor John Harvard, donated his library, started that school to reach the Indians. Yale was then established as a seminary. Princeton was also established as a missions beginning to teach young men and women how to go into the mission field. But of course, you can see how it's drifted. And we can see that in this great awakening, that although God's intentions were right to bring us back to him, we would often slip and forget again and again. Four different great awakenings took place. In fact, the last one is in the 1960s and 70s in the Jesus Revolution, and that's where I got saved. I'm glad I'm a part of the great awakening. However, as years have gone by, I notice that there is a different thing that I call now the great awakening. That people think that the wokeness is the way to go. It's a culturally accepted uh, uh, perspective. And it's starting to blur the lines be between scriptural truth and cultural acceptance. And the church is getting sucked into it. The ones that really don't want to take sides are becoming passive. It almost reminds me of the proverbial frog in the kettle, where they put a frog in a pan of lukewarm water, and then incrementally they start to turn up the temperature until it's a bit inconvenient for the frog, and then it just boils him to death to the point where people now eat the legs off of that frog and he doesn't feel a thing. Now, that sounds a little tough, but that's exactly what will happen if we as God's people remain passive. And I want to charge you today. We are headed into the last days. I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or the next 10 years or the next 100 years, but the Bible tells us how to live in this era. He's assigned us. He, he, he could have had you born in the 1400s, but for some reason, folks, look around. He had us born now in the middle of this turbulent society. And so we have a very specific assignment that we want to make sure that we fulfill. Now, I want you to hear this carefully. We don't know the day nor the hour, but we can surely know the signs of the last day. The date, April 12th. April 14, 1912. This ship was dubbed unsinkable. 2,200 passengers bought tickets to go on this maiden cruise across the Atlantic. The name of the boat? The Titanic. It hit an iceberg. And the captain said, it's just an inconvenience. We'll be fine because this boat is unsinkable. But it wouldn't be long before the whole boat would go down, 1,500 people would die in the freezing waters drowned. It was a sad epitaph to a grand opening for a maiden voyage of the Titanic. And did you know the song that the orchestra was playing while the ship was sinking? It, it was, they just had that orchestra keep playing the song over and over again to kind of keep the people's minds off of what was going on. Do you think that song was this one? Every night in my dreams, I see you, I want you. No, 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 no. As the ship was sinking, this was the song. If you'll notice it, it's a hymn. And as they were playing this, the boat was sinking. People were screaming, but they kept playing this thing again and again. And I think, could that be American churches where we're just listening to these hymns while our legs boil to death? Our country starts to sink and people are dying without knowing Christ while we sing nearer my God to thee. We don't know the hour nor the day of his second coming, but we can sure know the signs. 
And let me tell you some of the signs that are going on. AARP just reported that in the last few years, $10 billion were stolen through scams, primarily through elder people, elderly people. And the world meter on the internet says that worldwide, six million deaths occurred during the pandemic. Six million worldwide. That was as much as the Holocaust. But nobody reports it much. There's fire and floods and hurricanes. The Associated Press just said 235 more people died in, in Helene and Milton, the hurricanes on the East Coast. It's getting that close. American Immigration Council reports that $324 billion have been spent so far on the border trying to keep, uh, keep illegals out. Even with that, 20 million have already entered the country. Now, I want you to hear this. They didn't only bring with them themselves and their bags, but they brought with them 240,000 pounds of fentanyl have come through. Do you know how much that is? You know how many doses that is? 240,000 pounds of fentanyl? 1.1 billion doses. You don't under, you understand what's happening to our country. We can understand the times that we're in. And then I think of it this way. Abortion is allowed since Roe v. Wade started. 50 million United States citizens' babies have been aborted. 50 million. That's nine times the Holocaust over that but nobody cares but the church should care and then there's gender confusion trans bi non pronouns that's why the national institute of mental health has just reported that one out of four kids 18 through 24 are now showing far increased symptoms of anxiety disorder with depression and suicidal thoughts and then there's wars and rumors of wars israel against hamas and then the protests in America for Hamas against the United States. And then the Ukraine war with Russia. Did you know that the United States just promised $8 billion more of weapons for the Ukraine, starting with $327 million for precision glide bombs that have engines in them that are glided by satellites 81 miles. And 81 miles from the border of Ukraine is going to go into Russia. Guess whose satellite systems are guiding those missiles? Us. So that's why in a recent Security Council meeting, President Vladimir, Vladimir Putin said this. He hinted, Moscow could respond with nuclear weapons. Did you know that they have the most nuclear warheads, over 5,000? United States is second. Russia has the most. Moscow could respond with nuclear weapons to a joint attack from a non-nuclear country, Ukraine, backed by an ally with nuclear capability, USA, from the Newsweek magazine. We're that close. That's why the Pew Research Center just said that four out of ten people believe that we are indeed in the end times. Do we know when? Mm -mm. But guess what? You know who's in the, the crosshairs of all of this? You. The church. If the church can be quiet, the enemy can have a voice. But what will trump the voice of the enemy will be the church. And so we must stand up. Listen to Matthew 24, 24. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the... That's you. That's you. Because Christians are starting to blur the lines between spiritual truth and cultural acceptability. But we have a choice. The Bible says this. We have a choice. We can go into these last days with fear or with faith. On the defense or on the offense as victims or a part of the victory in the last days. I don't know about you, but I want to be on God's side when it comes to this. <laughs> Do 
But God tells us what to expect, not to scare us, but to prepare us. Everybody got that? God tells us these things, not to scare us, but to prepare us. Because let me use this illustration. God is like a pilot. And if you have a good pilot, he'll get over the intercom and tell passengers about impending turbulence. He'll get over the intercom, ladies and gentlemen, over the next four minutes. We'll hit a little bit of a turbulence, but we'll be looking for smoother air. So would you stay in your seats, fasten your seat belts, and we'll let you know when it's time again that you can get up from your seats. Thank you so much. I think, hmm, that's a good pilot. And you see, God is a good father because he does the same. He keeps us informed. And he's saying between now and the second coming, expect some turbulence, but be of good cheer. The scripture says it this way, in the world you will have turbulence, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So you and I are a part of his plan. Nevertheless, he says this, and this is an instructive. He says this, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived gear change. You, however, here's the instruction. He's giving context. Evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, so it's going to get worse. Deceiving and being deceived. But you, what are, we, are, what are we to do? Read this next line. You, however, go. Continue in the things you have learned and have become convinced of. Stay steady is what he's saying. Stay steady. Because the world's going to have turbulence, but it's looking for stability. And if the church isn't stable, they have no hope. So stay steady. So today, I'm going to give you four items of turbulence that we're going to face where we fall. Four places of turbulence where we have a tendency to fall. And then two places where we must stand. Got that? Two places where we must stand four places where we're prone to fall. So I call this my two-by-four sermon. Because <laughs> God's going to get our attention so that we can be awakened but not awokened. So let me give this to you. There's four places that, of turbulence where we fall. The first is deception, just plain deception. Deception. The Bible says it this way in, Gal in Genesis 3. He was talking to Adam and Eve, and he said, you can eat of any tree, but the one right in the middle, mm, sorry, mm -mm. fruit might look good, but mm -mm -mm -mm. okay, got it? Got it. Satan comes under the picture, and the Bible says he was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that? Come on. And what he does is he reinterprets the Bible. He reinterprets the word of God to fit his agenda. Is that happening? Hey, you better believe it. And you can see that all around us. I call it language laundering. Language laundering. You'll hear very slick words that seem really good, but it hides a toxin, a poison. So the labels changed on poison. And just because they changed the label and it looks attractive, it's still going to kill you and they're going to eat your legs. So what are they? Well, look around. The word abortion is now called reproductive justice. See the language laundering? Homosexuality is called LGBTQ and the rainbow. Pedophilia, people abusing children for sexual intentions. It's now called minor attracted people. Sounds a lot better, doesn't it? Same poison. And surgery to remove vital organs without parental, parental permission is now called gender-affirming health care. Do you understand the language laundering that's going on? And it, it will actually fool even the elect. Even the elect. And by the way, this is just a personal thing, but Genesis 1.28, God said to Adam and Eve, Go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. Cover the earth and take dominion. Be fruitful and what? Now, that's an order of the Lord. Abortion has taken 50 million kids. Same-sex marriage, you can't have kids unless you adopt. And now you have trans and surgeries 
that makes a man into a woman, a woman into a man, but can't reproduce at that point. You look at the onslaught of being fruitful to the point where we can't even find workers. We have to import illegal immigrants at the tune of 20 million who don't have the American DNA and may have nefarious purposes and brings in drugs. And how many cells do you think are in the United States right now? All from within. And you think, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? Here's the good news. Did you know that when Moses came onto the scene, God had appointed him to lead two million people out of bondage? Pretty cool, amazing anointing. But when the enemy knew about that, guess what Pharaoh ordered? He said to the midwives, when you see a woman giving birth to a baby boy, I want you to kill that kid. Did you know it was pretty barbaric, but it was abortion. When Jesus came onto the scene in the New Testament, Herod was so concerned that the people of faith would overwhelm his corrupt government that he had his people kill every male child two years and under. Read about it. Barbaric abortion. Now, ours is a lot more civil, a lot more surgical, but 50 million. So it's almost like when God wants to bring a great awakening, there seems to be the signs. And now another redemptive uh, uh, Messiah, the signs. I wonder what God is planning. And so the good news is you and I get to be a part of the great awakening, but the devil's raising a great awakening. So we have to understand and see our purpose here on this earth and not be deceived. The language laundering. This is a passage that just appeared in the Chinese textbook of professional ethics and law being taught in China to secondary school students. So it's high school students. Listen to this. It quotes a story in the Bible. It says this. Jesus once said to a crowd who indignantly claimed to stone a woman caught in adultery. He said, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her to her death. And those who heard him stopped moving forward. Okay, so far so good. All right. Here's the next sentence. When they slipped away, this is in their textbook for high school kids. When they slipped away, Jesus stoned her to death, saying, I too am a sinner. But if the law could only be executed by people without sin, the law would be dead. So according to this short story, how do you regard that law? Now, if you don't know the Bible and you're reading this in your textbook, do you understand the amount of, of Chinese kids that have a deceived view of Jesus. So now these are happening. That's why the Bible says it's going to go from bad to worse. So you're going to have deception. And then that's the first turbulence. Watch out for that because there's going to be language laundering and don't get fooled because remember the crosshairs, is on, crosshairs are on the elect. It's on you. The second thing is not only deception, but counterfeit. And I want to explain this to you because this is pretty interesting. Counterfeit. I, the, the quote by William Booth just rings in my heart. He said this, the chief, chief danger that confronts the church will be religion without the Holy Spirit. There'll be a day where there'll be Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Salvation without regeneration. Or people get saved, they don't have to change. Politics without God and heaven without a hell. William Booth was a founder of the Salvation Army, yet he prophetically saw this in the future, the great awakening. But Revelation 13, 18 says this, and it comes up on the board. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of man, and his number is 666. What does that mean? Are we going to wait for people to walk around with 666 embroidered or, or tattooed on their head? That's the mark of the beast? Not necessarily. Let me ask you this, because I think it might be a metaphor. What's the, the number of God, the perfect number for God? Yeah, 777. 666 is really close. That's the one right next to it. And it might be saying the mark of the beast is counterfeit, where man looks like God, and it's that close that you can't tell the difference, but it's a counterfeit. If you want to know what God highly prizes, look at what the devil counterfeits. 
love, relationships, even the church. He'll counterfeit the church. So it'll look just like the church, but it's not the church. There'll be people gathering, but they don't want God to be a part of it. We found a newscast that actually talks about a church in Los Angeles called the Sunday Assembly. Here's a clip of what they're doing. Let's take a look at this counterfeit. You have to have faith. Our series, The State of Spirituality, asks the question, State of Spirituality with Lisa Ling. There she is. There's Lisa. We've been taking uh, looks at different paths of faith and fellowship here in these United States. And this morning, we bring you a story about an often overlooked but key part of this conversation. Non-believers. Lisa Lang visits a group hoping to offer a sense of community that's often found in churches and mosques and temples, but for people who don't want to get God involved. Did you catch that? You can count on me. At first impression, like one, two, three, this may look like a typical contemporary Sunday morning church service. The difference is the one I'm attending has music, it has a message, it has fellowship, it just doesn't have God. Did you catch that? Counterfeits. Looks like, smells like, even serves cookie and punch. But they don't want God involved. You have Christians like that? It could be the mark of the beast. 666, really close, but so far away. See, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can surely observe the signs, so we must know how to live. And I'm going to give you the places to stand at the end that answers that. But the first is you're going to see the turbulence where the pilot, God, says, expect that. Between now and the second coming, there's going to be some turbulence. For in the world, you will have turbulence. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So the first is deception. The second is counterfeits. And the third, turbulence, deceptive spirits. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we war not against man or flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. You know who's behind all of this? It's the devil himself. He would love to dupe the church so we become people who actually miss it by that much. Let's read what it says in 1 Timothy here, and it'll come up on the screen. Would you read it out loud? Go. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow and teachings that come from. That's why Ephesians 6, 13 says, so therefore put on the whole armor of God that you may able, be able to withstand in the evil day and having all done all to stand. By the way, we can be standing in the wrong place inadvertently because of pressure or counterfeits, etc., we get duped, even if possible, to, 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 to deceive the elect, the Bible says. And we can stand in the wrong place because our perspective has been skewed. Now, I need you to hear me very carefully. Are you ready? Listen carefully. Your, pers your perspective will create your reality. That's why it's so important to make sure that you have an accurate perspective of what's going on and don't let it be shallow or one-sided or biased or self-centric because your perspective creates your reality and your reality creates your identity and your identity is going to create your future and maybe even your eternity. That's why the scripture says in Matthew 6, 22, for the lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is clear, if you see things clearly, your whole body will be filled with light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be filled with darkness. And if that light that is in you is darkness, your if your perspective is wrong, that light that is in you is darkness, how great shall that darkness be? So your perspective is so important. So you say, well, where do you get the right perspective? Here's the second thing I want you to hear. If you miss everything else, catch this. Here it is. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. The Bible does not just contain truth, it defines truth. Did you get that? The Bible does not just contain truth. Oh, there's nice stories in there. The Bible doesn't just contain truth, it defines truth. And so this is absolutely critical in getting an accurate perspective because it's going to create your reality. So the de deceptive spirits are really crazy because it's going to try and skew your perspective. What you're about to see is a video clip from a Lutheran church and a Lutheran pastor that we have what we call the Apostles' Creed. 
The Apostles' Creed was, was actually um, coded and uh, it was codified in 325 AD. It's called the Nicene Creed. And churches throughout the centuries use that as the core of our beliefs because it's just the, a biblical summary of what we believe and why we believe. This lady pastor here is having the congregation repeat after her a very deceptive laundering that's a part of the great awakening. Listen to her as she leads, and how many people are repeating this called a sparkle creed in church? Let's listen. Look, the take a look. Sparkle creed. I believe in the non binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the ace quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love. So beloved, let us love. And you hear how many adults are repeating that. So the deceptive spirit says, I believe in a non-binary God whose pronouns are plural, who has two dads. And can you see how it's so self-centric? So we take the Bible, launder it to our perspective that creates a reality that may, may lead many to a Christless eternity. There is a demonic spirit behind that that makes it sound so good, but it is not good. Deceptive spirit. And then the fourth item of turbulence is the pressure to conform. Pressure to conform. You're gonna have pressure from the outside so that when you open the doors of your heart, it sucks it right in. You know, when we were building a recording studio, an audio recording studio some years ago, because of the racks of instruments and the technical equipment we had that would get hot because of the electronics, uh, it would suck dust in. And we would constantly have to be vacuuming the dust until we found an, an engineer that said, oh, Wayne, what you have to do is the pressure inside of the studio has to be greater than the pressure outside. Because if it's less than because of the heat, when you open the door, it's going to suck air in because it, the pressure is greater on the outside than inside. And it's going to suck all the dust in. You have to make it so that the pressure on the inside, you bring in air conditioning with no outlet. You just keep it nice and strong, and it's filtered. So when someone opens the door, the air from the studio goes which way? Out rather than in. And the Bible says exactly that, that the pressure on the inside or the presence of the Holy Spirit has to be greater than the attraction of the world. Otherwise, you open your heart and Everything just starts coming in. And so then our perspective gets based on very shallow thinking, worldly thinking, and it creates a false reality. Peer pressure to conform. It happens all around. Here's two clips of people talking about the pressure to conform. Would you run that? Post the reel and follow this trend. And those things are actually training conformity behavior. Jobs, school, you know, peer pressure, crowds in general, social media, TV, they all train conformity behavior. You fit in with everyone else, do what everyone else does. Here's what everyone's talking about. Talk about what everyone else is talking about. Be like everyone else. Do the popular trend thing on TikTok and the algorithm will show you to the world. How do I know that? Because through uh, different folks, I have, I have seven grown kids and, and I interact with them and their friends. And they are in different groups of society, most of them swinging left, very liberal. But within those groups, when you get to know people, they look around and make sure that nobody's listening and they'll be like, hey, actually, I really agree with this or I'm not really anti-gun, but if I said that, 
I wouldn't be able to garner these business opportunities that I depend on. Because if any of these clients knew for one second that I was pro second amendment, that's it, man. And this is the type of pressure that people are under. Pressure to conform. So you can't really tell people what you really think. There is not freedom of speech because of that pressure to conform. So out of fear, we go into a world. But God does not want us to face it with fear. He wants us to face it with what? With faith. So the pressure to conform, be careful. Because remember, the Bible doesn't just contain truth. It defines the truth. So four places in which we fall. But let me give you now the answer. Ready? Two places that we are to stand. Ready? Number one, you must take time to stand before God. In solitary, early in the morning with devotions, stand before God and let his light shine on you by reading the word of God. Jeremiah 15, 19 is a wonderful scripture. It says this, therefore, if you'll repent, then you shall return. And if you stand before me, so it says, before me, you will stand and watch this. And if you can extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my what? You see, the world does not need a religious echo of themselves. They need to hear, thus saith the Lord. They need a buoy that gives them passage to a safe harbor. Otherwise, they will be tossed and turned by the turbulence of the cross currents of this age. If you'll extract the precious from the worthless, you'll become my spokesman. Then he says this, they for their part may turn to you, but you on your part must not turn to them. In other words, you are to bring them and usher them to Christ, but don't let your lack of pressure get, get you sucked out. Be real careful. And the scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Someone once came to me and said, Wayne, I have so many desires in my life to do this, and I know they're wrong. How do I get them quiet? I said, you don't. Huh? I said, you don't. He said, well, how do I get them all tamed? I said, easy. You can't cut out all those desires because you're human. So what do you do? Make your desire for Jesus the greatest desire in your life. And then the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Make Jesus your greatest desire. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I remember when my wife was going through birth pains, so she was in the hospital ready to give birth, and then one of those contractions hits, you know. She says, look at me, look at me. So I said, okay, what? She said, help me breathe. Yeah, they teach you how to breathe, right? Hoo, hoo, hee, hee, ha, ha, I can't remember. It's been such a long time. <laughs> that was in another life. But hoo, hoo, yeah, I can't, whatever it was, you know? And then she, so she's breathing with me because she's perspiring. <laughs> and then I looked at my watch, like, what time is it? She grabbed my head. She said, you look at me. <laughs> you don't mess with my wife. But it's almost like Jesus graciously would say when we're looking at the turbulence and the problems with the world, he says, no, look at me. I will keep you focused. Look at me. Fix your eyes on Jesus. So the first place to stand is stand before God. Please take time. If you don't, the world will suck you in. And the second place to stand is then you can stand before people with courage, with confidence, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. The Lord was confronting some false prophets. And the Old Testament says it this way in Jeremiah. If they would have only stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people. And they would have turned them from their evil ways and their evil deeds if they would have just stood in my counsel. And I'm wondering if one day the Lord wouldn't say, if you would have just stood in my counsel. So stand before God because he'll give you the confidence to stand before people. I want to give you an illustration. I, it's winter is coming, and so I wanted to kind of like uh, give you the, show you the gloves that I use in the wintertime to keep my hands warm. And, uh, 
And uh, these, they really keep my hands warm, but it's hard to grab stuff, but nevertheless, and it's missing a finger. I don't know where it went. But I want you to see on one hand, there's stuff that the culture gives us called cultural acceptance. This is how we see it. That's how you must see it. I'm going to give you the pressure to conform. If you don't, I'll persecute you. In fact, they redefine love as love is if you agree with me and endorse me, you love me. If you don't, you hate me. Why are you people such haters? Do you understand the laundering that they do? That turns everything on its head. It's just it's deceptive. So be real careful. Remember your perspective is what creates your reality. So make it right. And the Bible doesn't just contain truth. It defines truth. That's the plumb line. So if this is your only choice, then you become sucked in to the cultural acceptance, a cultural narrative. But watch this. When the church stands and there's biblical truth, uh-oh, now guess what? People have a choice. But without it, they don't have a choice. This is their only choice. But when this comes up, hey, you're giving people a choice. Get out of here. Quiet down. Don't say anything. Why? Because this is the choice. This is what we want. This is what we want people to think. This is the narrative. This is the ideology. This is it. Uh, no, there is another way. No, there's many ways. Many ways to God. No, there's just one way. Stop it. You're messing us up. And so there's going to be persecution. Shut up, he says, and sit down. We say, no, we're just going to stand. So if that doesn't work, here's what the world will do. Dance with me, come on and out, uh, 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 can't you see? Come on, dance with me. I can't. Yeah, if you don't, though, you'll lose congregants. They'll leave your church. Dance with me, okay. So we start dancing, and we just make it more religious, but it's the same thing. Pretty soon, we're dancing like this. Now, one day, God may speak to this person's heart because there's, his perspective is found to be false and is wrong. And one day, he's going to go, oh, no, I knew in my heart all of this wasn't right. My life is just in such a problem. What should I do? Where can I find stability? Well, I can't find it in the church because they're just like me. So where do they find hope? The world is confused and the devil cackles at the quietness and silence of the church. But the Bible doesn't say, hey, church, beat on them, fight them, be militant, hate them, oppress them. No, he says, stand, to stand. Dance with me. I'm going to stand for Jesus. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No, 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 dance with me. <laughs> no, I can't. And one day the Lord says to this guy, this woman, you need help. I do. Where can I find help? Hey, you haven't changed. That's right, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come, follow me. And what happens? That's where redemption begins. But unless we stand in this time of the great awakening, if you start dancing with the world, it may seem real loving. That's because you misdefined love. Don't do that. The church is the hope of the world. Don't let it go bad. And it's time you and I stand. Did you know that even secular companies now are starting to see it even before the church does? The DEI, the diversity and equity and inclusion thing, uh, it, it's, it was actually to solve a problem in the beginning. But people with nefarious agendas, bad agendas, hijack those things and use it for their purposes. When that happens, it spoils everything. And now it be, it's a dangerous thing. In fact, secular companies are now saying we don't endorse that anymore. One of the most recent ones, Toyota, says we don't endorse that. We're not going to go, we're not going to support gay or, or pride events no more. John Deere says, no, we're not doing it. I'm glad I got John Deere tractors, that's why. So John Deere says, no. Harley Davidson just said, no, we're not going to do it. Tractor Supply just stood up and said, we're not going to be doing that. Even Coors Beer says, we're not endorsing that. That's it. I'm switching brands. Uh, no, I'm just joking. Just joking. 
But I look at those and I think, listen, if secular companies are seeing this, when will the church see it? Do we have to be followers of secular companies? By the way, did you know as I was reading it further, the reason all of these companies saying they're not endorsing that, they're not going to go that way, is because customer feedback. And I bet there were Christians in those companies saying, boss, that's not right. We don't want to work here if you're doing that. Whoa, 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 okay, okay. Listen, when you stand, you can change corporations. You can change the world. But if we sit down and not vote, we don't make our voices heard, no wonder there's a great awakening. So church, it's time to stand. And I want you to do that. We're going to recite the Apostles' Creed in just a second. But I, I know, by the way, there's a, oh, there it is, an app on my watch that when I'm sitting too long, it says time to stand. And it's time to for Christians to stand. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So let's stand together even as it says. It's time to stand. And I want you to repeat the Apostles' Creed. It's going to come up on the screen, and let's read it together. And when it says Catholic, it just means universal. That was the original definition. It was not a denomination. The word Catholic means universal, not just American church, Spanish church, Portuguese church, praise the Lord, and uh, Russian church, all of the people in the world are one family. So that's the word Catholic. So when you read it, it's like, oh, no, it's not a denominational thing. In its original etymology, it really means universal. So, Father, we ask that you would weave this message into the very fabric of our souls so that we might be a church in these last days that stand as you asked us to. We shall do that. For you called us to be the pillar and foundation of the truth that don't move. So, Lord, that's who we are. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Would you recite this with me? Go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen.